Right, so this is the results of another of the ilse ifbic task forces. So, you know, composition was task force 12, whole foods and proteins was task force 10, and this is uh, task force 9. Uh, we could criticize that we refer to them by numbers and people nor normally uh, don't associate them with particular topics. But anyway, we had a, we had a, a working group, a task force, specifically to look at trait stacking. And in particular, we're looking at breeding stacks, which is two independent traits. Uh, this morning they mentioned they had herbicide tolerance and insect tolerance that were engineered separately. The safety was assessed separately. And once you know, both of them had their safety assessed, they get crossed together to put uh, both traits into uh, one, um, one single plant. At the present time, um, uh, such breeding stacks account for about 25% of the hectareage of uh, transgenic crops on the, on the planet. That, their uh, stack traits are grown in 13 countries, and they account for about 40-some uh, million hectares of production, and their use is increasing, because you know, farmers don't like to choose between one trait or another, they want both traits. However, it is the perception, I think, in many places that crops do have no traits in them unless you engineer them, which is uh, usually not the case. So because of that perception, there are two types of concerns that different groups have expressed about what could happen if you engineer, uh, if you make a breeding stack. One group is afraid that uh, we're going to affect the stability of the genome. They, you know, a lot of the uh, genes have uh, the same uh, DNA parts. They might have the same promoter or the same terminator. And that means that the same DNA is present twice in the genome. They could cross over and recombine and destabilize the genome. And the second one, uh, concern is about the interactions between the products of the transgenes themselves. So here is the um, task force. And uh, one of the things I did not mention yesterday is that when um, when uh, the task force completes its report, it goes out to about 30 experts around the world, and normally about two-thirds of them uh, return comments, and then the task force has to consider all the comments that uh, come back, and only then is it submitted for publication. And then the publication will send it out for review again, and then the, review, the reviewers might send comments. And it's, it's a complicated uh, process. But by the time we're done, it should reflect not, not just the consensus of the task force, but of uh, you know, uh, uh, key experts around the world. So as we have been doing is and with the other task forces, we go back to conventional plant breeding as a guide. And this is a photograph of uh, the wheat variety trials at the University of Kentucky. This was uh, where I went to school to study agronomy. This was my first job I had was to mow around the test plots. But the point is that there's many varieties, and each variety is different from each other. You can see that they look different. Some are more mature, some are taller. Uh, there's compositional differences, disease resistance differences, and whatnot with them. So if this is a leaf. So the point is there's a lot of variability there uh, that breeders have developed. This is a soybean leaf, and it's from one of my uh, test plots. And one of the graduate students uh, brought it to me and just showed, you know, can you imagine that, that little piece right there, we had one insect and three different diseases. And that's what farmers face in the field. So as has been alluded to this morning, a farmer has two choices. 
They can control everything with chemicals, or they can go to a breeder and ask them to find the genetic resistance. So what conventional plant breeding is, it's stacking genes for desirable traits. A lot of them have to do with disease and pest resistance, but they also stack traits for agronomic qualities uh, and uh, quality traits as well. So this is an example of a seed catalog for soybean. And on the one direction, you have the different varieties. In the other direction, you have the disease that they're resistant to. And there's this particular variety then uh, that is uh, more resistant to, to uh, you know, has about three uh, resistance genes in it. One can go uh, two or three farther down, and you see one has four resistance genes in it. Well, there has never on earth been a soybean in the wild that had those four resistances in it. They were put there by breeders. So the general pattern is that if we have a variety, like the one you see in the back, we go to the germplasm, the wild diversity, uh, and yesterday I showed you that the wild relatives look very different from the cultivated ones. So in the foreground, we have a wild soybean, and a lot of the traits uh, are, can be found there. Uh, normally we have to screen a few thousand, but usually one will have the trait we want. So in this particular case, we're trying to uh, control a disease. It's a uh, frog eye leaf spot, and the, this wild one happens to be resistant. So it is the job of the breeder to cross the two of them together, and then as they segregate out, the breeder needs to get rid of all the bad traits that, uh, that the wild one has. You know, it, it's viney, it has very small seed size and everything else. The job is to get rid of all the negative traits and keep the resistance. And that's how these disease packages are built. And you know, modern soybean varieties now have probably about a dozen genes in them that were added one by one in this fashion. Again, I showed uh, this yesterday. The cross is made. Uh, you bulk up the segregating populations, and you screen. And after about a decade of getting rid of uh, the unwanted types, we end up with one variety that's hopefully resistant to the, to the trait. So during the selection process, the breeder is selecting the desired traits, so the ones he intends for, which are, in this case, would be the disease resistance. And sometimes there's unintended traits that appear that uh, might still be desirable. Uh, you know, sometimes you get transgressive segregation and you might have a better maturity date or higher protein. You know, it, 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 plants never fail to surprise you when, they're, when genes are segregating out. And at the same time, they are getting all the undesirable traits out. A lot of those undesirable traits were expected. You saw one of the parents that was small and viney and ugly. And then, again, unintended traits sometimes appear, uh, like a new susceptibility or something, and you just discard those. So today's cultivars, the, the, of the big varieties, are really the result of trait stacking. This is the example of one of the uh, Erie rices, IR64, and if you count, it has traits in it from 20 different land races all wrapped up into one, uh, one, one variety. So a monoculture today is very, very different from the way a monoculture was 50 years ago. 50 years ago, it would have been one land race uh, planted in many areas, whereas now the best traits of each one, all the resistances are from the various ones are uh, stacked into one which uh, makes them a lot more resilient than if that had not uh, been done. So back to our two questions. Is stacking going to affect DNA stability? To address that, we went back and asked how stable is the plant genome? And can the stability be affected by stacking events? If you remember yesterday when we were talking about composition, I, one of the concerns was that any 
instability in the genome could also activate all the dormant pathways and create uh, toxins. So we want to know how stable is the genome, and then if, can two, two copies of the same DNA create any additional uh, interactions that are a safety issue? So as I mentioned yesterday, changes in the appearance or behavior of a crop are always, well, barring a few epigenetic ones, are always due to changes at the DNA level. So therefore, we can use the changes at the DNA level that breeding and domestication cost to predict the safety of the transgenes. So the first step is to understand what happens at the DNA level. And fortunately, the human genome has been the best thing that could have happened to plant sciences. All the technology that has spun off from the human genome is available for plants, the high throughput sequencing and, and, all, and all sorts of other assays. So the, uh, the first thing to, is that the plant genome is not a fixed entity. They're highly variable. Uh, probably two branches of the same plant can have altered genomes. Part of it comes from the natural mutation rate that I think somebody mentioned yesterday was uh, one per 10 billion base pairs per generation. But plants are full of transposons and retrotransposons, what are commonly called the jumping genes, because they move around the genome and they actually create their own insertions. And then there is a copy number variation, which is one of the new concepts that's coming in, that different genes can be present in different uh, copy numbers. And I'm going to show you examples of all of this. So beginning with the effective insertions, remember yesterday uh, the reference from science and also the reference that uh, SR Rao showed from the Koenig reference, insertions are one of the concerns. Well, you have jumping genes that move around. The phenotype is very uh, clear. I think everyone has seen flowers like this before. And what happens is that uh, there is a gene for color production. It was probably a chalcon synthase. A, a, a jumping gene inserted itself into it and inactivated the gene. But in, a, in one cell, it, uh, in one cell over here, it jumped back out, restoring gene function, and then all the other, that whole colored sector are, uh, came from that original cell. And, uh, you know, the, we can find these in uh, our uh, crop plants. And here, you know, this phenotype in, in the corn is uh, due to uh, jumping genes, and uh, these spots that you see over here are due to uh, jumping genes. So they have been part of the food diet for a long time, and many times even selected for because of the patterns that they produce. Just looking at one example, uh, when they're sequencing genomes, many times they filter out the transposons and just report coding genes. So I have singled out this, uh, the cacao, the chocolate sequence, because they report the genes, the number of protein genes, but they also report the number of jumping genes, of transposons. And there's almost, there's twice as many jumping genes than there are genes. And that's probably fairly uh, commonplace for genomes. Uh, here's an example of a uh, uh, corn inbred. This is MEXC1 that Barbara McClintock used. And if you notice, in this particular one, you see all these uh, genes that have jumped here, and if you go into um, B73, which is one of the commercial inbreds, it's got a totally different pattern uh, of uh, genes that have jumped into it. So how common are insertions? This is a publication that came out less than a year ago. What you see in the middle is a pedigree of different soybean varieties. So here are some of the older ones, and you get down to... Um, to um, you know, sister varieties that probably derive from the same cross. And what they did then is they resequenced all these genomes and counted the transposable elements in it. And the numbers in, um, in this purple-violet color 
are the unique insertions, you, you know, unique jumps that are found in that variety and only in that variety. And in just this limited sample here, you have 31 genotypes. And in those 31 genotypes, there's t over 25,000 unique insertions. You know, again, unique meaning found in one and none of the rest. So if you look again at these two, uh, even though they, they're sisters, you know, they came from the same cross, they differ by almost 500 unique insertions. What about the field level? This just happens to be a rice field, and uh, there is one of the original rice um, ancestors, or one of the original varieties of rice. This was widely grown in uh, Japan uh, up until World War II or so. And there, they have measured somewhere between 50 and 60 new insertions of one type of transposon uh, called MPing, between 50 and 60 new insertions per plant per generation. Imagine doing biosafety on that. So some of the more, uh, more modern varieties have fewer insertions, one insertion per three plants per generation. So the breeders have uh, selected for sta uh, you know, stable phenotypes, and one of the ways they've done it is with reduced uh, in, uh, transposition frequencies, but still, one new insertion for every three plants for every generation is still a really high rate. So this is clearly then something that has been going on in farmers' fields probably ever since agriculture was invented. Here's a really cool uh, paper. What they did here is they had one rice plant, and again, this is the same uh, transposon. Two, uh, two seeds from the same plant take up for 20 generations, and at the end, uh, one has uh, 435 unique insertions, and the other one, 243. Only 23 were still in the original spot. Then a lot of traits have appeared in recent history. So yesterday I showed the original tomato was a very small one. And then uh, from it came the large one. And then the breeders have been selecting for all sorts of shapes and sizes. And then you have this long one here. This long one here is thought to have or originated in Spain uh, in the not too distant past, probably within the past century. And the, what that is due to is you have uh, almost 25,000 base pairs that are on chromosome 10, and these got duplicated, and the duplication was inserted into a gene on chromosome 7, with the net result that the promoter from the, um, from the um, gene they went into drives the sun gene, which is involved in auxin biosynthesis, and that changes the expression pattern of the gene, and you get the long fruit. It's uh, one of the things that our cons people get concerned about, but again, you, cannot, you can only get traits that are already present in the plant somewhere. You're not going to get brand new pathways out of, the, out of thin air. We also know that genes are constantly moving into the nucleus. They can go from the mitochondria to the nucleus or from the chloroplast to the nucleus. What, well, this is chromosome painting. This is uh, the 10 chromosomes of corn are across the top, and each are the inbreds uh, are the, uh, on the rows. What these arrows are is DNA from mitochondria that got inserted into the nucleus of the different inbreds. And if you look uh, down the columns, the patterns are different. You know, it's here. And this one, this one has one, and this other place, this one doesn't have one at all. So these are insertions that occurred, again, probably in the last 50 years or so, as these inbreds were being uh, developed. And then there's natural gene transfer. You know, plantains have the entire genome of banana streak virus. Uh, you know, rice has parts of the bacilliform virus. Uh, tomatoes have the vein clearing virus uh, DNA in them, and, you know, they're there. S, insertions. So the, the second question was, what about the gene duplication? You know, does having two copies of the same gene cause problems? Well, looking at some of the original work, uh, this is ribosomal DNA. 
It turns out that some of these inbreds have not two copies of the same gene, they have 5,000 copies. Or this one has 8,500 copies, or this one has 23,000 copies. So if 23,000 copies of one gene are not going to cause a problem, we don't, really don't think two copies of the same gene are going to cause a problem. Plants in general turn out to have a really, really high level of natural duplication. A lot of them are polyploids, you know, where the, where the entire genome is doubled in them. A lot of genes uh, occur in families. Uh, maybe they might be expressed uh, in different tissues, but their coding sequence is, uh, is highly similar. Transposable elements, uh, for example, barley, this one element is present in 50,000 copies in, in barley. This one accounts for 5% of the genome in wheat, and rice can have over 98,000 copies of this particular, uh, the ping pong element. So the net result of all this is variability. You know, DNA expands and contracts, and this is a technique called chromosome painting, and what you have here, again, across the top are the 10 chromosomes of maize, and these are different inbreds. And they have used different uh, fluorochrome for different types of DNA, you know, green for the centromere, red for some repeats, white for other repeats, and so forth. And if you look down the columns, you really see a lot of variability in the DNA uh, types. You know, this one has a lot of the blue here, this one has very little, this one has none, this one has white here, and, and, and so forth. So the, the transposable elements and the gene families changing in number end up to big uh, genomic variability. And it also ends up affecting DNA content. Here's a, a soybean, again, uh, looking at these varieties. The t variety with the most DNA is up here, and the one with the least DNA is here. It's a 4% difference in DNA content, and it's equivalent to 34 million base pairs difference. So again, plants can tolerate 34 million base pairs difference without altering their safety or their viability. And with corn, it's even more extreme. This is a, a variety of corn in Mexico. And uh, the Mexicans have sequenced this genome. It has 22%. That's one-fifth less DNA than the commercial inbred of B73. So the worst thing that could happen from genomic instability is loss of transgene expression. And we consider that to be a commercial issue, not a safety issue. And it should become apparent in seed production fields. Uh, this has been published, uh, and the conclusions, by the way, all publications from the task forces are always available from the IFVIC uh, website. And uh, the recommendation is that, uh, you know, again, the question of whether stacking of events would alter DNA in a way that would impact safety. And we concluded that every single situation that causes a concern in stacks happens in nature anyway. So the conclusion was there's no novel concern, and a genomic analysis, a DNA stability analysis of stacked event products does not contribute to safety. So we really need to focus on possible interactions between the transgene products. Uh, this came out just uh, almost a month ago. It's uh, ACRE, as the advisory committee releases to the environment in the United Kingdom, uh, under their Department for Environment, Food, and Rural Affairs, and they just issued three reports. And one, and report number two is why a modern understanding of genomes demonstrates the need for a new regulatory system for GMOs. Uh, and the executive summary, our understanding of genomes does not support the process-based approach for regulation that the European Union has. And the nice thing about it is they based it on our publication from Task Force 9 that I just showed you on the previous slide. So somebody is listening. So the second question was on interactions and stacked events. By interaction, we could be interactions of the transgene products. Uh, 
But in this case, the biochemistry of the genes is known, the, meta the metabolic changes caused by the different uh, genes is known. And because you have that information, you can actually make predictions about possible interactions between traits in the stacked event. So because you can make these predictions, you can come up with a hypothesis and uh, come up with an assessment. Uh, keeping in mind that the presence of interaction is not the same thing as a safety risk, and I'm going to show you that. And we would do this on a case-by-case case of uh, approach where every, two, every gene combination is unique. So the question then, is it expected or probable that the products of the transgenic events are going to interact? And if they do interact, could such an interaction be a safety risk? So again, go back to traditional plant breeding. We always go back to traditional plant breeding as our baseline. Well, one of the discoveries that has come out uh, from genome sequencing is that not all individuals in the species have the same genes. That was, one of, I think, one of the bigger surprises. So, for example, uh, starting from the bottom, they just, by sequencing four varieties of soybean, they found 133 genes that only exist in one variety and not in another one. In the top one, they looked at a larger sample. They looked at uh, about 30 varieties, and they found 856 genes in wild soybean that were not in domesticated soybean and vice versa. Potato, they just looked at two genotypes of potato and found 275 genes. And I'm not talking about alleles. I'm talking about genes present in one genotype and not the other. And with corn, the two main commercial inbreds uh, differ by several thousand genes. So the significance of this is that when one crosses a variety without one gene to a variety with a gene, it sets up the exact same type of interactions that adding a transgene sets up. So it gives us a basis for study. Another thing that we looked at is transcription factors. Uh, actually, we, this was uh, even a previous task force uh, uh, started on that. And a lot of the domestication is due to changing uh, trans, uh, transcription factors. So the larger tomato comes from changing transcription factors. Uh, here is a really old picture, 500, you know, almost 500 years ago from Europe. And the thing to notice is here, how tall the wheat is compared to the people. You know, they were shorter back then, but still the, the wheat was, was much taller then. And, it, and one of the things the Green Revolution did was shrink the size of wheat, dwarfed it. And that's due to a transcription factor. So the take home message here is that we can change transcription factors, get large changes, uh, beneficial changes, but there has never been a safety issue with it. So again, conventional plant breeding as the baseline, we know that, that interactions always happen in conventionally bred crops. The best example of an interaction is hybrid vigor, which you can see in the photograph where the, the cob in the middle is the cross between the two parents on either side. To this day, we don't know what causes uh, heterosis. We don't know the basis for hybrid vigor. So therefore, we cannot test for those interactions. We accept they happen in plant breeding, but we cannot test for them. In contrast, the genetic basis for a transgene is very well known. And therefore, we can make a hypothesis on possible interactions with that. So we came up with a series of uh, tests of guiding questions. Is a protein formed by one of the transgenes? Are these proteins able to interact with each other? Are they in the same part of the cell or in different parts of the cell? Are they structural proteins? Are they enzymes? Are they part of the same metabolic pathway or not? Are the gene products, uh, do they stay in place or do they move in the plant? Uh, do the gene expression patterns overlap? And if you put it all together, the question is, if there is a possible interaction, uh, 
of the products and that the interaction was not part of the initial safety assessment of the individual genes. So if the, uh, the answer is yes, the next question is, is there a possible mechanism for an interaction? Can you explain the biological basis for that interaction? And can a hypothesis be formulated about the effect of the interaction? And if you do that, and if the interaction can result in an adverse effect, then you need to do a targeted uh, food feed safety assessment. And by targeted, we mean the products of that interaction. We don't mean starting uh, from scratch. However, if we cannot identify any uh, negative effects from the interaction, there, we don't see any need for, um, for, the, um, for any assessment of a stack, any new assessment of the stack. And likewise, if uh, the original question that there was no potential interaction to find, we don't see anything to be gained by doing any type of a sa uh, safety assessment. So some of the case studies, and uh, the most common stack out there, which is insect resistance and herbicide tolerance. There are different biochemical pathways. They're located in different parts of the cell, so there's very low probability of an, an interaction so we think the initial safety assessments are enough, and really nothing else, uh, doing you know, anything else you do is not going to contribute to safety. Example two is enzymes or substrates that are part of the same metabolic pathway. Clearly, th this is an interaction. They're part of the same metabolic uh, pathway. So we need to figure out what's the hazard that could come from this interaction, if any. And depending on what this hazard is, you may or may not need to do a targeted assessment of the stack. If the product of the interaction is well known, meaning it's got a history of safe use, no new assessment is needed. And here's an example then of inter in an interaction that results in uh, products that are well known, that have a history of safe use, and that would be the carotenoids used for aquaculture. Salmon flesh, you know, salmon flesh is white, and the color comes from carotenoids that uh, marine bacteria make and which bioaccumulate in, in the food chain in the ocean, and, and the top predator then, the salmon, is the one that has it. And again, the price of the salmon really depends on how the color of the fr flesh. And the idea is, as, farm, as uh, salmon are being farmed and of caught in the ocean, uh, soybean is being looked at as a source of protein for them. And so, you know, why not just uh, engineer soybean to produce the carotenoids? It's a carotenoid called estacanthin uh, for it. So the, the metabolic pathway is, uh, the top part is very similar to what happens with golden rice. You add a phytoene synthase, and then existing uh, enzymes converted to beta carotene. At that point, you uh, have to add a ketolase uh, to it, and the net product is estacanthin. But again, it's got a history of safe use. It's well characterized. There's really no nothing uh, that's going to surprise us there. So as long as the interaction does not result in a novel product, there is no safety issue. Third example was the subunits of the same enzyme. Obviously an interaction. And the example we put in there was this one. It's ATP uh, plus glucose 1-phosphate gives uh, ADP glucose plus pyrophosphate, and that's where you get uh, a substrate then for starch. The enzyme is a heterotetramer. It has two different uh, subunits, each one present uh, in two copies. So you could engineer with two transgenes, where each transgene is for one subunit. And this is going to give you a protein-to-protein -protein interaction. And the net result is more starch, it's that, which is not a safety issue. Example four was the broad 
plant responses uh, to transcription factors. As I mentioned before, the tomato size is an example of uh, transcription factors. The, the issue here, again, is that we're mirroring traditionally bred traits. Transcription factor is going to change the timing of expression. It's going to change the amount of expression, but it's not going to create anything new. So uh, we don't, because there's nothing new there other than timing and amount, we don't see any additional safety assessments needed. The exception would be if we have uh, overlapping ex uh, gene expression patterns that did not exist before and that two genes are being, they had never been expressed in the same tissue or being expressed in the same tissue for the first time, you might want to do a safety assessment on that. All right, to find something that would really cause problems, uh, we had to look far and hard and we came up with a hypothetical, and I really want to emphasize it's a hypothetical uh, example. The first transgene elevates levels of a cyanogenic glycoside for pest resistance. And if you're a pest, you're out of luck, but it's not a toxicological concern. You can destroy it by cooking. Uh, you're in good shape. The second transgene is uh, a beta-glucosidase that goes into the vacuole. And normally, it has no, no substrate in the vacuole, so it's not uh, toxic. However, if you chew the raw leaf, the, the contents of the vacuole get mixed with the contents of the cytoplasm. The beta-glucosidase then can go to the cyanogenic glycoside, cleave it, and you get cyanide. That is definitely a safety issue, and safety assessments are required. So this one has been published as well, uh, and the conclusions here were that if there is potential for a transgene interaction based on what we know about the traits, and if the interaction is going to lead to a potential adverse effect on safety, and we would do this on a case-by-case -case basis, you might require targeted food or feed assessment of the, of the stack. And really, we think that for the current generation of plants, we don't have a lot to worry about. It's the stuff that's coming down the line, the metabolic pathways. When we start putting in uh, pathways that do not have a history of safe use, where interactions are really going to need to be studied. But if there is no reasonable expectation for an interaction, you cannot make a hypothesis for why a hazard would be there. The food feed safety assessments of a single event should be enough. So the overall conclusions of the two uh, parts of the study is that genome instability is not affected in a measurable way by having two copies of the same uh, transgene, and so there's no need to assess it. And the need to assess the interactions uh, is really going to depend on the traits that are being combined. And if there is a need for an assessment, it needs to be based on a hypothesis. You know, what is it you're testing for as opposed to, let's just take a big look and see what we find uh, there. So to put it in a different words, stacking of most transgenes is as safe as stacking traits in conventional breeding. And there's only rare combinations that should need an additional safety assessment. So I got asked uh, as well to talk about stack development. Um, and the, this is not my area of expertise. We put out a call from different people in, in the region, and we got some uh, comments back. But the thing to notice is uh, the number of uh, events coming down to Pike, Asia, is accounting for about half of the events coming down the pike. And a lot of them are uh, expected to be, you know, for use in Asia, uh, not to be part of the uh, global commerce. So 
half of the events are coming from this region. So the trends where things are going, the, it took 13 years to get the first 30 events out. And it's expected that the next six years could see three times as many, uh, you know, 90 events coming through. So by 2015, there's 24 events expected on the market. And if you start looking at the, the stacks, you could have, say, three genes in them. Just those 24 corn events with three genes in them, that's 2,024 possible combinations. The soybean, there's 17 soybean events on, in the pipeline, and just with two uh, stack of two genes, say an oil quality herbicide tolerance, you have 136 uh, different possible combinations. What I'm getting at is that if you treat each combination as a new event that has to have a complete safety assessment, you need, you need uh, a lot more regulators. So, you know, how each country is going to cope with that, I'm not sure. But right, so right now, you know, essentially in the United States, whenever there's a stack, there is no food feed safety assessment done on it. There is environmental safety done on it, but not a food feed stack. And it's the same way in Canada and Australia. Uh, Brazil, Argentina have simplified uh, requirements. Uh, they just want bridging data to show that no major changes have taken place. As far as Asia, uh, the, again, when we sent out the call for information, we got feedback from Taiwan, Philippines, and Singapore. And all three are currently treating stacks like new events. You know, just go back to ground zero and start from the beginning. Australia, uh, no additional review is required. And then yesterday, we got information from Vietnam. Uh, they have submitted a draft of their new regulations to the uh, sanitary, phytosanitary provision of the WTO. And according to uh, the draft, if, uh, if a breeding stack, if a single, event, single events have been assessed for safety, they do not require any additional assessment as a stack. So in this case, they're following the Australian example. And uh, with that, uh, that's my story on stacks, and thanks again for your attention.